The science of the 19th century that gave rise to this perspective has been eclipsed by major developments in science over the last 100 years in three main areas, cosmology, physics, and biology. Let me talk first about the, the, the cosmology or the astronomy. The shift in this field starts in the 1920s. There's a now famous astronomer named Edwin Hubble. Most of us have heard of him because of the famed Hubble telescope. It's kind of a bummer for him because he's a really great scientist. He got a telescope named after him and it's always broken and they have to go up there and fix it. But anyway, Hubble starts uh, working in the 20s. He comes out of law, the field of law into astronomy at a really propitious time. They're building these great dome telescopes. This is the 100 inch uh, diameter telescope at Mount Wilson that uh, Hubble used. And using these great big telescopes, the astronomers are, are able to, at this time, to start resolving these onto photographic plates, the light coming from little tiny, distant, uh, previously indistinct points of light in the night sky. And it turns out that these little indistinct points, once uh, the light is collected over, with a long exposure on a photographic plate through these big telescopic lenses, re, the, the, the light starts revealing structure. And this is a picture of what's called a spindle nebula, and there were others, spiral nebulas, and, uh, oh, that, that, sorry, that was a, yeah, well, that's a spiral, and here's another spiral nebula. Now, this reignited a debate that had been going on in astronomy between astronomers who thought that our Milky Way galaxy was the only galaxy, uh, and other astronomers uh, who thought that there were other galaxies beyond the Milky Way, island universes, if you will, beyond the Milky Way. And this was called the Great Debate in the 1920s, but in 1924, Hubble was able to settle this debate by using some new techniques for estimating distances. He was able to, de to determine that the Andromeda Nebula was actually the Andromeda Galaxy, that it was a separate galaxy. And the way he was able to show that is he was using these new techniques for measuring distances. He determined that the Andromeda Galaxy, one of the closest ones to us, is 900,000 uh, light years away. That was his estimate at the time. And we, the astronomers thought at the time the Milky Way was only 300,000 light years across. So clearly it had to be way beyond the Milky Way, therefore it was a separate, a separate galaxy and the Andromeda Nebula, which just meant gas cloud, was renamed the Andromeda Galaxy. That was pretty awesome. And as they began to look at other points of light using these same techniques, they found that there were galaxies in every direction of the night sky. In fact, if you look at this little square that's highlighted on the PowerPoint, that's like a, a little tiny part of the visual field, maybe like a dime at arm's length. And now if we were to a, a magnify that, it reveals galaxies galore. In even the tiniest little quadrant of the night sky. Is, and, and the current estimate is that there are about 200 billion galaxies in the visible universe. So in just a, the space of a decade, our sense of the, the immensity of the universe was just magnified incredibly. Now that was really, an, that was an, an amazing discovery, but even more important was what was discovered as a result of the light coming from these galaxies. Turns out that the light was redder than, than the scientists expected. You know how if you, if you uh, shine light through a prism and se it separates into colors, the red through to the, the blue and the violet, and the re red light has a long wavelength. And if an object is, is emitting light and moving away, it will cause the wavelength of the light to stretch out and it will look redder than it would otherwise look. So the, the, the light coming from the, 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 the gases in these faraway galaxies looked redder than similar light would look coming from if we looked at it in the spectra in a laboratory. And they call this the red shift. In other words, the wavelength was stretched out. It's kind of like the the Doppler shift with sound. When, if a train whistle goes by, it goes, hmm, the sound, well, that's the wavelength of the sound stretching out. The same thing happens with light. And so the, the scientists were able to, dis, to discern that the galaxies are actually moving away from us. That's what the red shift meant. Now that had incredible implications for uh, the question of the origin of the universe itself. Hubble used data from a an uh, unsung hero in astronomy named Vesto Slifer to, uh, about this red shift. And um, so here's, here's, the, here's the implication of all this. If the galaxies are moving away from us in every direction 
in the forward direction of time. The only way that could be true is if there is a kind of spherically symmetric expansion of the universe, that everything is expanding in the forward direction. So if we think of, I got a visual aid, in the forward direction of time, you have the universe getting bigger, bigger and bigger, and the galaxies, every galaxy getting further and further away from every other galaxy. But if you wind the time clock backwards, if you back extrapolate, and you think, well, what was the universe like 100 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or a million, or a billion, or however far back you go, eventually you get to the point where all that galactic material is going to congeal or would have come back to the same point, a point marking the beginning of the expansion of the universe, and arguably the beginning of the universe itself. And so we have, from observational astronomy, the first hint that the universe has not been here eternally. It's not eternal and self-existent, but rather it had a beginning. This is one of Hubble's plots showing that, that there was a law um, the further out the galaxies are, the faster they're moving away. And that, again, can only be true if, it's, if the universe is expanding in this spherically symmetric way. Now, about this time, actually a little before this time, there is a famous physicist with really bad hair <laughs> who had come to the, a very similar conclusion. And this was Albert Einstein. He, he was uh, in the 19-teens, still working in Germany. Eventually, he came to Princeton to escape the Nazis. But in the teens, he came up with another theory, a, a new theory of gravity known as general relativity. And we talked a little bit about this last night, but it's basically the, the, the conceptual idea behind it is that matter causes space to bend such that other matter passing through that space will have its motion changed by, that preferred, by those preferred lines of trajectory. So as a result of this, he's thinking, well, if matter causes space to bend, then that means that if all you have in the universe is that gravitational uh, field, then everything should be collapsed onto itself into something like a black hole. But we don't live in a universe like that. We live in a universe where there's massive bodies separated by empty space. So there must be some countervening force of expansion to, to, counter, to, to offset the gravitational force, which means that the universe must be in some way dynamic. There's something pushing outward. But if something's pushing outward, he's, then that will, it would imply that there could have been a beginning. And that troubled Einstein. Because at this point in his career, it was different later, but at this point in his career, he was very much a scientific materialist. And so he, he, he posited something. It was kind of a fairly arbitrary conjecture on his part, but he proposed that this outward pushing force, which he called the cosmological constant, had exactly the right magnitude so that the outward push was exactly balanced by the gravitational pull and you had a universe that was static, neither expanding nor contracting. It was kind of a contrived value that he assigned to this, but it worked to eliminate the idea of a beginning. And for a time, for him, that was a sigh of relief. But then in the 20s, the physicists, other physicists started working with these equations and they realized, you know, that's pretty contrived, Einstein. That would be an incredible degree of fine-tuning to have that cosmological constant with exactly the value that you, you, Einstein, chose for it. The math allows a lot of other values that would imply, most other values would imply a dynamic universe. That's thing one. And then this amazing physicist, a, a, a Belgian Catholic priest named Father Lamatra, um, is with Einstein at a conference in the 20s. And they're in a taxi cab ride going to the, the conference. And Lamatra tells Einstein, first of all, your, your physics is contrived. The equations really suggest a dynamic universe. You know it and we know it. But also, have you heard about this redshift data that Hubble's working with out in California? Because it's showing that the dynamic expanding universe is really what you know, the heavens have talked back, in effect. In, in effect. And Einstein was, listened to Lamatra and eventually made his way out at Hubble's invitation to Pasadena, California, and had a peek for himself through the, the, the Hooker 100-inch telescope and came out and announced to the media after seeing this in his heavy German accent, he came out and said, I now see the necessity of a beginning. 
and later and explained that the value, this arbitrary value he chose for the cosmological constant was the greatest mistake of his scientific career because he allowed his philosophical presuppositions, his predilections, to determine his scientific theory rather than letting the evidence decide the question. And um, anyways, a great moment in the history of science. It established what is now uh, known as the Big Bang Theory, when you have this convergence of theoretical physics, general relativity with observational astronomy, and that in turn established that the universe had a beginning. Now, Einstein was not the only, the only scientist at the time who didn't like this. Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, a famous British astrophysicist, said this. He said, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order is repugnant to me. I should like to find a genuine loophole. I simply do not believe the present order of things started off with a bang. The expanding universe is preposterous. It leaves me cold, he said. Uh, this in psychology is known as the theory of denial. <laughs> you, know, you notice what the evidence he's citing? He's not citing it. He says, philosophically, he doesn't like it. And uh, later physicists, you know, because you have to ask, well, what's the big deal? Why are physicists so upset about the idea of a beginning? Uh, Princeton physicist Robert Dickey put it this way. He said, he said, an infinitely old universe would relieve us of the necessity of explaining the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. If matter itself comes into existence, then you can't invoke matter as the cause of the origin of the material universe. You need something that is immaterial, that transcends matter. And this uh, conclusion was highlighted later in the 1960s by some work uh, by Stephen Hawking. There's a bigger story here that I'm compressing and maybe with Guillermo, uh, we can talk a bit more about it. There were, after the Big Bang was proposed, there were some other models proposed, the uh, steady state model, the oscillating universe model, these were each attempts to preserve an infinite universe that didn't have a beginning. But one by one, as more observations of different kinds came online in astronomy, these were set aside as inadequate theories. And then in the, in the mid 60s, there was an extraordinary development in theoretical physics. Uh, Stephen Hawking, probably know of him, wonderful, um, uh, inspiring figure. You know, he, the physicist confined to a wheelchair with the ALS disease. When he's working as a PhD student, he's working on black hole physics. And he's aware of the way that you know, matter causes this, the, the, the space to curve. And he begins to think, and that's what, a black, you know, he's thinking, okay, that's what's going on with the black hole. There's so much matter, it's curved so tightly, you can't get anything out. But he starts to apply this idea to the universe, and he's realizing that as the universe is going forward in time, matter's getting more and more dispersed. But as you wind that clock backwards again in your mind's eye, you eventually get to the point where the matter is so tightly curved, or, or the matter is so densely compact that space is getting tighter and tighter, more tightly curved in its curvature, and eventually the mathematics, something called the field equations of general relativity, which he and Roger Penrose solved, imply that they're is an infinite curvature at some point in the finite past. Now, an infinite curvature corresponds to zero spatial volume. And then you have to ask what we discussed last night, how much stuff can you put in no space? And the answer is, well, no things go in no space. I mean, it's, and so th this singularity theorem has this profoundly anti-materialistic implication. And it happens that Hawking worked for much of the rest of his life to try to, uh, as W.C. Fields put it, he was looking for a loophole. You know, he was looking for a way around this conclusion. Uh, Hawking was a really interesting figure. He was a kind of um, theologically sensitive, even you could say God-obsessed atheist. And uh, so he was aware of what he'd, he'd shown in 1968 with Penrose, but then he was developing other other ideas, one called quantum cosmology, which we can discuss in the Q&A and which I discuss at length in my new book, trying to find a way around this, this conclusion. But the, the straightforward application of general relativity to the origin of the universe implies a creation event. And um, we'll have a little quiz on these equations afterwards, but um, anyway, this is the idea. The curvature goes to an infinite, zero spatial volume, the astronomer Robert Jastrow said, this is an exceedingly strange development, unexpected by all but the theologians. He's writing in the 80s. Uh, and no, notice our starting point. Remember our start, my starting point with Dawkins? He said that the universe is exactly as we should expect if there's nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. But the, these uh, 
astronomers are saying, no, this is totally unexpected from a materialistic standpoint, but it was expected by the theologians. And Jastrow went on to say, for the scientist who's lived in, by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He scaled the mountains of ignorance, he's about to conquer the highest peak, and as he pulls himself up over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians <laughs> who have been sitting there for centuries. Entirely expecting that the universe would have a beginning because after all, in the, in the, the biblical witness, you had the first, very first words are, in the beginning. Arno Penzias, one of the leading physicists who played a big role in this story in refuting what's called the steady state theory with his work on uh, the, what's called the cosmic background radiation, put it this way. He said, the best data we have concerning the Big Bang are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. And indeed, it is rather striking. The first words of the Bible are in the beginning. In the epistles in the New Testament, there are two different mentions of the plan of God existing before the beginning of time, which is really striking in light of relativity theory because uh, the singularity theorem implies that time itself is a created entity which has a beginning. And uh, there's even mentions, 11 or 12 separate mentions in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, of God stretching out the heavens, either having stretched or stretching out the heavens. So uh, the, this new cosmology is in a way very much expected on this, from the standpoint of theism. It also helps revive an ancient argument for the existence of God that went like this. Everything that begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist and the universe, therefore, must have a cause separate from itself. All causes are separate from their effects. We call that transcendent or separate cause God. 